Most of you know that in 2005, I got a very nice letter from Archbishop Berg excommunicating me, but that wasn't the most difficult part of being kicked out. The letter, I think, one day may be worth something when I sell it on eBay, <laughs> but what was much more difficult was what happened a few days later. My bishop sent a notice to every seminarian and every priest in my diocese, forbidding them to talk, email, or call me ever again. So all of a sudden, in a space of a few days, I became a pariah. I became a leper, not to be touched, not to be talked to, not to be emailed to. I moved very rapidly from being one of us to the other, those other people those other priests. It was much more challenging than receiving a nice letter of excommunication. Because if you go to seminary for nine years, as I did, if you think of the church as your family, it hurts when that family disinherits you. It hurts when all of a sudden you are on the outside. Unfortunately, that experience on being on the outside of being the other is very common to our human experience. For some reason, we people enjoy dividing our society into us and them. And us usually are the good guys and them are the bad guys. We apply these labels to people often. If you are white, them are all the non-white people. If you are straight, then are all the non-straight people. If you are Polish, then are all the non-Poles. If you are men, women are they, strange creatures never to be understood. <laughs> we continue dividing this world into us and then constantly. And these labels, these divisions, these exclusions eventually cause tension and drama. And this last week here in St. Louis was the best proof how dangerous these divisions can become, how divisive those labels can turn out to be. It has become very clear to us this past eight days here in St. Louis that we are a city that needs healing, that we are a city that needs someone to bring us, to bring us together, that we need to rip off all the labels we place on ourselves and the others and come together as one city and come together as one society. If there is anyone or anything that can achieve that goal, it should be our faith. It should be our church. Interestingly enough, in the Jewish scripture, the people of Israel often thought of God as 
their God. God Yahweh is often referred to as the God of Israel, the God of Moses, Abraham, and so on. Because early on, Jews believed that there are many gods, but our God is the strongest. Our God is the most handsome. Our God is the most powerful one. You remember Ten Commandments? One of them says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Those other gods in their minds did exist. Every nation, every ethnicity had their own god. So Egyptians had their gods, Canaanite had their gods, Babylonians had their gods, and Jews were fine with that, as long as they knew that our God is the best, that our God is the most powerful, and our God will kick your God's butt. This has been the prevailing theology for most of the Old Testament's history. The monotheism as we know it is a much later development. The faith and belief that there is only one God has developed later on. And today's first reading is a great witness to this development. Isaiah says, the foreigners who come and place the sacrifice on this altar of God, their sacrifice will be acceptable. And my house, my temple, will be a house of prayer for all the peoples. Now, if Archbishop Burke was Isaiah Bishop, Isaiah would be excommunicated because a good Jew does not say such a heresy. You may know that in the temple of Jerusalem, only Jewish males could enter in. Nobody who was non-Jew was allowed to go in, even more so to place a sacrifice on the altar. And here is Isaiah saying that the foreigners those illegal immigrants will come and place the sacrifice on the altar and God will accept it. Isaiah was lucky that Archbishop Burke was not born yet. <laughs> this is a heresy for faithful Jews, for the Gentiles to come and pray in the temple of Jerusalem is unthinkable for the foreigners to be together with the chosen people was a big no-no. And yet, this is the vision of Isaiah. The house of God is the house of prayer for all the peoples. The chosen nation is slowly coming to an understanding that our God is God of everyone. That, truth to be told, Jews and non-Jews are very much alike. And that our God calls all the peoples to worship Him. This was a huge step in developing truly monotheistic religion. This was a very huge discovery in believing that after all, there is only one God, and we all are His people. We all are His people. Unfortunately, this division between us and them has continued to haunt us. Even Jesus was not free of that weakness. Today's gospel passage can be somewhat troubling. A woman who was a pagan woman, 
Matthew call her, calls her a Canaanite woman, someone who was not Jewish, from the outside of Israel, needs Jesus' help. So she begs him, Son of David, help me. His disciples tell him, send her away. Jesus initially pretends to ignore her, pretends she doesn't exist. Hear no evil, see no evil. I don't see anyone. Is someone talking to me? That's usually our first reaction to the other. We pretend not to see them. They don't exist. As long as they don't bother me, I'm just fine. But eventually, Jesus has to face her reality because she's a stubborn woman. I think she might be Polish. <laughs> she insists, I really need your help. She would not leave him alone. So finally, Jesus throws out a racial slur at her. He says, I can't feed dogs. I have to take care of my children first. Feed dogs? Are you trying to offend me? Am I a dog compared to Jewish children of God? Now, if this was my mother, she would have slapped Jesus on the right cheek. How do you talk to a woman? Maybe she did, maybe she didn't, but Jesus wakes up and finally comes to his senses and remembers what he is all about. And perhaps because to her consistent annoying, Jesus grants her wish. But you see, even Jesus was not free of the temptation of dividing people between us and them. We continue to do that today as much as Jesus did in the first century. We, the white people, some of us who are the white people, are as guilty of this as those who are brown and yellow and black and every other shade. We who are straight, we who are gay, are equally guilty of dividing society into two groups of people. We who are men are as guilty as those who are women of thinking of terms us versus them. We who are Catholics are guilty of thinking of the others as less Christian or less godly people. This division of the world continues to live on because I think in the back of our mind we still think that God is our God and not theirs. If we truly come to realization that there is only one God and each one of us, no matter your skin color, your orientation, your gender, your age, or language you speak, or your legal status as an immigrant, each one of us has the very same one God. If there is one God, we all, with no exceptions, are God's family. There is no Polish God and American God. I don't know, maybe Jesus' name would be Jesus Kowalski if he was Polish. But no, it wasn't. There is no straight God and there is no queer Jesus. There is no black God and white God. There is no Jesus from Mexico and Jesus from Boston. We all believe in the very same God. We all have the very same DNA. 
We all come from the hands of one loving God. And all the labels that we place on ourselves, all the labels that we place on other people, are mistaken and not justified. If we want our city, our country to start healing, if we want our wounds slowly to heal and make us stronger, this healing process has to start somewhere. And the church is the best place to do that.